Hi, Shaker. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. I've waited a long time. Well, I hope it's worth it. Is this worth it just to meet you again after so many years? If somebody had told you ten years ago, Shaker Kapoor, your film is going to be up there with the Golden Globe Awards and the Oscars, how would you have reacted? I would have probably said, Aapke <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't disbelieve any dream, any fantasy that I've ever had. Because um, if I disbelieved it, it would never happen. Mm. And ultimately, it's your dreams and fantasies that come true. So, so today, in its reality, how do you react to it? Um, it's interesting and it's exciting. Each thing that happens is one step forward and you say, you know, it's like climbing a mountain and then you've climbed a bit more and say, okay, I've got there, now I can't rest too much and now I've got to start all over again. Things are happening so fast and then the next peak comes so fast for you. It hasn't come that fast. I've been in this business a long time. Uh, it might have just got coalesced into into one thing, but the learning process has been going on. I mean, I've mm -hmm. made my first film um, in 1983, so it's been a long time. You have arrived where no Indian has gone before. It's the ultimate dream of every filmmaker. Why aren't you euphoric? Why aren't you crowing? I'll draw another analogy from mountaineering because that's something I used to love doing. The higher you go, the more rarefied the atmosphere is and you can't really breathe too much and you have to understand that you can't stay in one place very long. So the euphoria is, is strange. You don't have the time to be euphoric. Uh, you, can't, um, you don't have the oxygen to be euphoric. You know that you have to either move on or come down and start all over again. Yeah. So the euphoria very fast gets taken over by what you have to do next. Um, yeah, you're satisfied slightly for a while. That's what happens. But how has this success changed your life? Basically what changes in success is the way other people perceive you. True. I failed so often in my life and succeeded so often in my life that you learn very fast that you cannot allow yourself to be dominated by other people's perceptions. Mm. If you embrace the way other people perceive you, then you must equally embrace the way they perceive you when you're a failure. Mm. And it's all a cycle. I want to get, try and understand what you feel. Is it overwhelming? Um, it's stress. It's stress? Yeah. Because suddenly you have many more options. And options are always stressful. If you don't have an option, then you know what it's you have simple. to do. Life is simple. Yeah, life is simple. And now suddenly you've got like yeah. options as wide as this world. If I choose to make a film now, I have a choice between 200 films all over the world that I'm being offered. I can no longer say, well, I had no choice. I had to make that film. It was the only film I had. Yeah, now I'm responsible 100% for my next option that I take. When you finished Elizabeth, were you happy with the film? Were you sure you'd got it right? I'm still not sure I've got it right. Uh, I find it difficult to see it. I find it's taken me three years to accept Bandit Queen because Every time I saw Bandit Queen, I saw what I should have done. Yeah, now, uh, when I um, sit and watch Elizabeth, I haven't gotten over what I haven't done yet. I still cringe. I still see a shot and I still cringe. I just, I just, I want to walk out of the theater because of all the mistakes that I made. And then what do you make of all the, the wonderful reviews and the box office? Um, I'm lucky. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. Because when I'm making it, I'm, I'm groping. Every time I make a film mm. and people like it, it surprises me. When you, uh, when you started working on Elizabeth, you were fairly unknown in the international scene, apart from Bandit Queen. Tell me, were there any skeptics or any doubters? Yeah. There were? Of course. 
there are doubters in every um, every every time you make a film. There are doubters. Mm. The very people that asked you to make the film, having made a very brave decision, then are afraid of the decision they just made. Mm. All of us, you know, mm. when you you fall in love with somebody, you ask them to marry you. On the night of the marriage, you wonder. Yeah, you are afraid. So, of course. Uh, I, even the people that asked me to make the film, when I started uh, uh, getting into the film, they were afraid. It was uh, a different culture, a different era, and an Indian coming here and doing something on this culture, how's it going to work? They must have had their fears and their qualms. And you sense their fear, yeah. because suddenly they're putting $25 million on, on, on a man that's never made a film in English. Exactly. Uh, on a man that's never made a film outside India. On a man that's never made a film over $1 million. Mm. It's a scary business because it's like somebody else driving your car all the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, and people have put all this money in and you're in charge. Mm. And that's why as a director you have to become like a czar. How do you do that? No, you haven't seen me on the set sign. I'm not approachable to any questions. I think I just have such a confident... Um, aggressive air about myself. You work with such a formidable, eclectic star cast. Was it easy getting them? No. no. They all said no. What are you saying? Yeah, initially everybody said no. What the film you see is not on paper. Mm. And I knew that we had uh, a script that was not exciting. So Jeffrey Rush had said no. Uh, Kate Blanchett had said no. Joseph Fiennes had said no to the script. So when I came in and I started to talk to them, then I gave them no choice. Um, like how? Uh, I just said no, 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 you're wrong. You don't see the film that I see. So the film that you read on paper is not the film that I see. And if you, fortunately, they've all seen Bandit Queen. Yes, that's, in, that's yeah, very important. Yeah, absolutely. What about uh, Lord Attenborough? How did you get him to go? Oh, he was the easiest. Um, when I wanted Lord Attenborough, they, uh, everybody said, no, 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 he'll never do it. It's too expensive. Everybody's afraid of approaching him. And, I just wrote him a letter saying, you know, you read Gandhi in India, we pulled out the stops. Um, now we, uh, I'm doing Elizabeth here, and I really appreciate it if you come and join me in this endeavor. And lo and behold, he phoned me and said, dear boy, of course, darling, I will do it. And, and uh, it was, he was the easiest, actually. He's the who, one who, who said no. Him? And he, of course, goes around telling everybody that, watch out, Sheikh, he's very really dangerous. If you want to say no to him, don't talk to him, don't meet him, <laughs> because he'll charm you into doing anything. Um, what about Fanny? Uh, Fanny Adon said no. What did you say? I said, don't say no till you meet me, because she had only two scenes, and she's a huge star in France, and there were only two scenes for her in the film. So I went to Paris, mm. um, and I met her in a hotel. You know, they had seats in the, one of the corridors, like, mm. and I said, okay, let me tell you about the scenes. And she said, okay, tell me. And I enacted with her that scene that she did with Jeffrey Rush, mm -hmm. just sitting there, <laughs> right there in the hotel bar. And I, it's a scene of great seduction. So I just did it with her right there. I just met her and I said, let's do the scene now. Let's do it. And then she did it one way and I said, now you see, there are 10 ways that the character can go 10 times deeper. So by the end of it, when I left, she says, you think I can do all these things? So it was not, no and no. no. I said, I have full confidence. I've seen your movies. I'm sure you can do all these things. But I heard you proposed to Fanny as well. Uh, I did. What Tell Where me about it. Where did you it. hear that? Tell me about it. Well, no, in the, in the end, I, I just said, okay, you have uh, a choice. Mm. You can either do my film or you could marry me. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, well, I think I'll do your film. <laughs> You're not such an exciting man. And she came to the movie. It was great fun, though. <laughs> That's Who right. told you that? I do my research. Okay. Right. Okay, and what about uh, Sir John Gielgud? I mean, he's the... He was all right. He was very interested in doing it. Actually. You know, he's 94 years old. 
I know. The only thing that the agent said that he only works between 11 and, and, and 1. So he can only be with you in two hours a day. Mm. And uh, watch out, he stares at the camera. Not and during a shot? During a shot. Why did he do that? I don't know. And I said, no, no, come on. It can't be. And I remember when I was shooting with him, um, my camera operator came to me and he said, Shekhar, this is really disconcerting. I said, why? He said, he's looking directly at me. <laughs> and I said, it's all right. So I put the camera where he would have to turn around and, and stare at it like that and oh. not at the actor. I don't know. I think it's years of theatre uh, because you relate directly to an audience. He's looking at the audience. He's looking at the audience. But you know, he just remembered all his lines like that. It really? was so strange. That's I mean, at 94, to give somebody two pages of, of dialogue and going, uh, and he's ready. That's training, good old training. But today, Hollywood is on the line. Who are the ones that you've enjoyed meeting, who you've vibed with? Uh, Antonio, of course, he's yes. a very dear friend. Uh, Brad, Richard Gere, I've mm. known for a long time. Um, Nicholas Cage. You're playing it very safe. You're telling me all about the guys, <laughs> not about the girls. Um, I don't know the girls that well. Um, I know, I mean, I know Venona Ryder and Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, no, I don't actually know the girls very well, I'm afraid. And perhaps I am playing it safe. I, I think you are. <laughs> you see, I have an agent in Hollywood who sees it as his, his eternal duty right now to ensure that my next film is not with a woman in the lead. I think Sir Chitra has paid him off. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> How different are these people, these Western stars, to their counterparts in India? Um, as human beings, they're not that different. Professionally, they're different. Um, why are they different? I think because they see themselves as professionals. Let's take Elizabeth, for example. I started, I would start shooting at seven in the morning and all, everybody, all the stars are supposed to re report on the sets at seven. Do you know, it did not mean 30 seconds past seven. But this is it did not mean one minute past seven. It meant mm -hmm. on the dot at seven o'clock. Whether it's your scene or not, everybody for the day would report on the sets. If your makeup is half done, you come half done. If you've, and I've never, ever, in the whole shooting of Elizabeth, ever remember any of the stars coming late, ever. Second, they don't come expecting to be directed. Mm. Um, it's a bonus if you direct them. Mm. They, the professionalism, they understand that the professionalism requires them to be able to deliver to the director on the first rehearsal something that is of quality and what has they have learned from earlier conversations with the director. Um, if an actor came up and said, okay, so what do I do now? They would never get a job. Really? Yeah, they would never Can't get a job. Believe this. So how has the Hindi film industry reacted to your success? Actually, I just n noticed in, in, in Stardust the other day that they do uh, this thing about the 50 most powerful people in, in, in the film business. And I, I was amused to see that I was number one. I was the of most course. powerful. Um, but I thought, well, you know, power is power if you use your power. If you're not going to make a film in India, then how can you be the most powerful person? You're not going to make a film in India? Um, not, not in the next. I think I'm going to do another two films outside. So that's another two years gone. Yeah. So I think... Um, after two years, I'll be back to number 50. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. What does your passport say? Does it say actor or director no, for it occupation? It says film director. It says film director? But for a long time, it said chartered accountant. So from chartered accountant in your passport, you jumped to film director. director. Never, yeah. never was an actor in between. I was a little embarrassed to put film actor. <laughs> actor, I was embarrassed. I, I, not because I, de I, I demean actors in any way, because I wasn't an actor. You know, I was just a guy who came in and said, I'm going to act. I'm not an actor. 
Did you enjoy acting? Um, I was trying to run before I could walk. Mm. I thought I was another De Niro. <laughs> and I didn't know the very basics of acting. You know, a few people tell you you're good looking, so you want to be an actor. You know, mm. that's, that's it. So Plus the genes. They always count the genes here a lot. Yeah. It's not going to body. It's not going to I did not realize the folly of it. I did the moment I worked in my first film with actors like Nasir and Shabana, I realized how silly I was because suddenly I started working with people that had all this experience and all this, this immense talent and, and, yeah. and, and techniques and everything. And I, I realized I was not doing it well and that kept nagging me. I did not have the facility. I mean, I admire people like Amitabh or Amir or Shah Rukh and all that. The, their ability to do it and carry it off. I still have it. And knowing all the problems I had as an actor then, I have great admiration for actors now. Okay. Um, despite two huge commercial triumphs in the 80s, Masoom and Mr. India, you found it difficult to get the kind of work you wanted in India. You have said that it was your own unbridled creative ego that gave you all the problems. Can you tell me what you feel today? I think it is wrong to put your ambitions onto other people. Um, there is a certain plateau over which um, Hindi cinema rests. Mm. And there is no reason to want to make the greatest film in the world for, for, for Hindi cinema or ask your actors to give the greatest performance in the world um, or get the greatest lighting in the world. Um, that striving obviously made every film run into trouble. That was one thing. Um, my ambitions, I was hoping that everybody else had the same ambitions that I did. Uh, that was one. I believe that the director is the most important person on a set. I think uh, you, you need to give obeisance to that creative energy of the director. And I found that that wasn't the case constantly. And so my ego would just take over and destroy it, you know. I believe one thing, and the system here believes that everything revolves around the star. And uh, that always created a problem with me. Whenever I did films with stars, I ran into a problem. Mm. You know, you, we work in a business where talented people don't always get the success they deserve. This is not to underrate your skills, but do you feel that some of the breaks that you've got have come by chance? I think all the breaks you get are by chance. This is what I wanted to know. How much of it is just hard work and how much is it that, that little fleeting meeting, no. that chance? Look, we live in a country of a billion people. It is impossible that there are not at least half a million people that have the same talent as my I do as a filmmaker. Mm. Half of them must be better. There must be at least a thousand people sitting in Bombay that are extremely talented directors who want to be directors. They don't get the chance. They may never get the chance. Now, there are two reasons they may never get the chance. A, because they don't trust their own destiny. Mm -hmm. They're too afraid of the chaos. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to take that jump. They feel secure in an illusory world of make-believe world of habit and security, which is totally make-believe in any case, mm. or it's not their destiny. Totally, absolutely not their destiny. So it's a pretty numbing mm. thought. It's a pretty humbling thought mm. to know. And keeps you grounded. That's true. You know, there is such a thing as a writer's wife. She guards his privacy. She gives him the, the environment to work in, protects him in a way. What does a director need? I need my solitude. Mm. That makes me kind of standoffish sometimes. Mm. Uh, I need understanding. Mm. I need a great understanding from my partner of that need for solitude. You know, and so the partner has to come to terms with that. It's that, those are difficult moments. Those are difficult moments. What is it like for a woman to have a relationship with Sheikha Kapoor? I've always been accused of not giving 
And I often wonder, because I'm a very emotional person, um, I always felt that I gave too easily, and people say you don't give, give very easily. Um, I think it's difficult, and the only relationship, certainly my marriage survives because my wife uh, constantly makes me feel at ease. She has a great ability to constantly be affectionate, mm -hmm. and I, I, then I flower in that affection. I, I personally find it difficult to, to give immediately uh, affection, and 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 it's not that I don't feel affectionate inside. It's not that I don't care inside. I'm shy. I'm shy of expressing it, mm -hmm. and when it gets expressed. Then I flower in it. Mm. I am learning from her. Do not be shy of affection. Mm. I'm trying to learn to give. But like a little child, I sit there still and wait for it to come. Yeah, you know, children do that. Yeah. You know, children do that. And somebody comes and does that and do you and then children react. Mm. That comfort I'm discovering. I can understand. I'm looking forward to meeting Suchitra and talking to her about the difficult moments and the happy moments. Okay. Suchitra, you're to blame for Shaker's vanishing beard. Oh, no, I had nothing to do with it. He just called me one morning and said, you know, the beard's off, so don't faint when I come back. So, and then I went to pick him up at the airport. You didn't recognize him? I didn't. I went into the customs enclosure and I was looking around like, where's my husband? Where's my husband? And there he was. And I recognized him because he wears the same clothes every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's how I figured out it was him. <laughs> well, I, I called her from South Africa to say I don't have a beard because I thought I'd surprise her, but I thought it might not be a surprise. It might be a shock. <laughs> but Sorry. I like him as much without as with. She told me this morning she wants me to grow but well, listen, I'm delighted to have you both here together on my show. With the kind of lives you lead, it's, it's almost a rare occasion, isn't it? Well, it's a rare occasion being together, I'm afraid. Well, as you can see, it's a sore point. <laughs> <laughs> it is a sore point. No, not really. We've got used to it. It was a sore point, but I think now it's kind of worked out. But in the last few years, what is the longest stretch you've been together? No, uh, while he was making Elizabeth, I was in London for three months at a stretch. And uh, so I guess that's the longest we've ever spent together. Yeah. So you really visit each other, don't you? Isn't that exciting? I think it's exciting. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, do you, I mean do, do you recommend it for others? I recommend it, oh yeah. It's like courting. You know, it's courtship all over again, every time. This is the result of both of you being very seriously career-driven. Both mm. of you. And success hasn't come easily to either, has it? No. Success never comes easily. But though he thinks I've got everything on a platter, and his constant thing is that, what's your problem? You know, everything has just been a lark for you, and you've never really tried. And No, no, no. That's not what I say. That's what no, you say. That's not what I mean. That's what you say. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, with her, she was, in, as far as I know, she was in college and she got picked and, and said, would you like to come and do a TV serial? And she'd acted in the lead of the TV serial and that became a huge hit. Then somebody said, would you like to model? And then she started to model. And then somebody said, would you like to sing? And then she'd like, she started to sing. I think that's probably... But unhappy. that's not my fault. Mm -hmm. That's how it worked. But that doesn't mean while I was working, I didn't work hard enough, no, Shekhar. That's I not fair. It. Your parents didn't uh, approve of your career, did they? No, it was unacceptable to them that... <laughs> the decent, well-educated South Indian daughter <laughs> was trying to do, you know, being a model and then she wanted to be an actress and then she wanted to be a singer. I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous in their mind. And it reached a point where I actually left home and I was living alone because they said, you decide if you want a career in the entertainment business, you get, you know, our daughter can't be that, so you get out of the house. And I actually got out of the house. Bag and baggage. Oh, yeah. And where did you go? Um, I lived with a friend for about two weeks and then I took a PG in uh, Marol and then I, I lived as a PG in Yari Road and... <laughs> that struggle? Well, that's when she met me, so... <laughs> I mean... 
So then how long did this carry on for? This went on for almost two years. Two years of living as a PG in the same city as your family? Yeah, but then I think that's what really uh, broke my parents. And they said like, okay, all is forgiven. Darling daughter, please come back home. And we understand that you're serious about it. And we accept it. In fact, I think now they're quite proud of the, you know, the way things have worked out. But you decided at a very young age that you wanted to be a star. Yeah. I think I always wanted to be rich and famous. <laughs> you went through a lot of uh, ups and downs in that. I mean, I know you don't think so, but I think any girl <laughs> walking out of her parents' house and fending for herself in the city of Bombay, it's not easy. You know, I used to sleep with a knife next to my bed because I was so scared. I used to be so scared in the night. Don't you think it was very brave of her? Yeah, but you should ask her to stop using, keeping that knife now. <laughs> oh, <my childish>. <laughs> <laughs> Next day I have to sleep with a person sleeping with a knife and a pillow, for God's sake. I don't do it anymore. That's an exaggeration. <laughs> that is a complete exaggeration. So career-wise, career, career -wise, what is your ambition? I've always wanted to sing and act in the same movie. A singing star. Yeah, sense. I want to be a singing star. And but you paid him a very great tribute recently. You yeah. wrote the lyrics of a song especially for him. Why did you do that? I just felt like, I mean, at that point, I just felt like. How did you feel about that? I, I didn't realize that it was for me until I was asked to be in the, in the video. And then I suddenly said, oh, this must be about me. <laughs> so I was, I was flattered. Yeah. How does it go? Jab se dekha Tujhe meri chao Mujhe mil gai Ek nai Zindagi Ek nai Zindagi Mujhe laga Meri baahu me Shekhar, at what stage in your life were you when Suchitra appeared? I met her during, just as I was going to the shooting of Bandit Queen. She, she came to the office to meet me. This was as an actress, as in an my actress. portfolio. You tell Actually, me. Uh, Gautam Rajadaksha um, had done my portfolio. So he said, you know, Shekhar is looking out for a girl, so why don't you go and meet him? And I very innocently went to meet him. <laughs> and tell me, can you remember what you felt when you first met her? I can't remember. I remember he kept staring and he took my number down and he kept calling and then my parents would go hysterical. It's not true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> that is not true it's at true. all. Do you like she, uh, oh, come on. This, uh, uh, she came to see me as an actress and I, I, I liked her, you know. She had a, she was effervescent and she was interesting to talk mm. to and she was obviously pretty and uh, I kind this of... This is the first time he's said I'm pretty because he's constantly looking at me and says, do people think you're pretty? How did you become a model? I can't hmm. decide if you're pretty, you know. I'm not joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've caught me on television now. Okay. Okay. Um, I had to decide at that, my, that time what I really wanted out of this girl, so I phoned her and uh, I knew one thing that I, I would not work with anybody that I had a personal relationship with. You know, as a director, you're in a very strange situation because you don't want to be seen as taking advantage of a girl that came to meet you because the reputation of directors who do that is so awful. <laughs> you already had that reputation. I know I did. <laughs> but it's a totally untrue reputation. Really? Yeah. I heard the other side. I heard that he never takes the initiative. He yeah. always waits to be pursued. That's true. Which Talking is true. You're talking about by actresses or by women? In any relationship. Yeah, it's so absolutely true. No, I, I wait to be. I, I'm, I'm too embarrassed, too shy. No. <laughs> yeah. I wait for a relationship to happen. I, I, I tell you that. I am not the great seducer that people talk, talk about. I do not believe that man is a great seducer. I think that all relationships are equal. And in a way, I don't, I don't like this whole attitude of uh, the man has, carries the responsibility to create the relationship. 
I think a relationship is created gradually between two people, tentatively, embarrassedly, shyly, but it's created by two people. So in that sense, I, I can't ever remember really pursuing. So what did you feel when you first met him? I was all of 19, but I just uh, knew that that he's going to be the man in my life, you know. And I think it took him a longer while to accept it. But in my mind, I was very clear. So who brought up the word marriage? You can ask her that question. I did. <laughs> I did because <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shekhar had been married before. He was um, a hardened, seasoned man of the world. And he wasn't, he wasn't too keen on another marriage, but I was very clear in my mind that this relationship would not continue if there was no marriage. Because that's the way I had been brought up and that's the way I think. So then, I guess, he had to make a choice whether he wanted marriage or he wanted out of the relationship. It was as simple as that. An ultimatum in a way. Yes, but there was a, like, there was the possibilities that I put to her that we could... Oh, I have to tell you this, I have to tell you this. Once he convinced me, he said, you know, he said, listen, you know, this is whatever, that we are modern people, and why don't we try living together, and you know, marriage is an outdated institution and all. So I said, maybe I'm being very, very stuck up about it and conventional about it, let me give it a try. So, but I said, we have to do it the proper way. You have to come and tell my parents. <laughs> so... <laughs> so most... <laughs> most, most men go to parents to say, can I have your daughter's hand in marriage? I went to say, um, can I take your daughter to live with me? You did. <laughs> I did. No, I did. I did. I did. I, I, I did it. Tell them that, um, I did it very reasonably and seriously. <laughs> and he's trying to explain to them. And the concept of, of living together and the modern modernity of, of how people are and the fact that how marriage has become an outdated concept. I, I built this whole intellectual thing which somehow and my mother sitting there sobbing and my father was sitting there absolutely, you know. How did you phrase it, Shekhar? I'm very curious. <laughs> this is the other first time I'm hearing something like that. No, no, but I, what I do remember is that she actually packed her bag and came back. Oh, I packed a suitcase and then I, I, went, I went over to his place and... She came to live with me for... But Dad didn't say yes. No, no, nobody said yes, but who, who can, you know, I think if they had said yes, she would not have come. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. But I think because the parents said no, <laughs> She, in this great rebellion, yeah. went and actually packed a bag, huge bag. It was very dramatic, and I packed a bag, and I said, bye, and everything, and I left. And then, but then once I reached his place, I couldn't handle it anymore. I sat awake the whole night, crying. Not even the whole night. Yeah, till about six in the yeah. morning. And because I thought, you know, I just kept getting my dad's face in my mind because I thought he's going to have a heart attack or something, and I couldn't handle it. I said, it's not worth it. I mean, it's ridiculous. Mm. So I just waited for daylight, daybreak, and I went back home. Again, bags and bags. Bags, 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 and, bags. And, bags. <laughs> and my parents didn't say anything. They just opened the door, and they just hugged me, and that's it. Then what happened? I think we decided to get married very soon well, after that. She then, because I was traveling all the time, she would come to my house and phone me in Los Angeles and <laughs> threaten me. Don't, don't talk nonsense. Yeah, You're okay. talking nonsense okay. now. Okay. And, 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 and Threaten? I yeah, yeah, she just said, she kept saying, she kept saying that, you know, either you get married or this relationship is over, or get married, this relationship is over. Because I was very clear that I, because to me marriage is like the ultimate commitment and if you can't make that commitment then, you know, you move on in life, that's all. And I, I kept thinking, well, here was a girl that actually did pack her bags to come and live with me and now it's all changed and I thought, God, I wish I had never gone to talk to her parents. <laughs> <laughs> and that changed the whole thing. And then I just thought about it. And, and uh, one day I called her and I said, OK, we'll get married. On the and phone? She, yeah. No, yeah, I think it was on the phone. And she said, yes, 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 I know you. When? when? I said, three days later. And she said, ah, it, it was Don't, don't dramatize it so much. Can I make making uh -huh. it seem like, you know? It was like something, OK, we'll get married in three days. And I don't think she believed me and actually went and did it. Why did you get married? I think I got married because I realized that that's the only way I could have her permanently in my life. I emotionally didn't want to lose her and logically didn't want to get married, but the emotion won over. Mm. And so we got married. Were you scared at all because you'd had a broken marriage? Were you scared of another commitment? I think so. I was. I was afraid because I thought I couldn't make a go of, of, of a marriage and, uh, and I didn't want to get into 
another one right. and another failure. And, right. But I understand that now. I mean, hmm. I mean, if I was to something was to happen and I was to get married again, I would be very scared. True, because horrible. one mistake you can live with. Yeah. Me. That's what I kept telling her. You don't understand what it is to live with me. Um, the kind of work that I do, the kind of person that I am. I mean, I'm not an easy person to live with at all. You see? I think if I didn't have my own career, if I wasn't passionately involved in my own work, if I didn't have outlets outside the house, I would have gone completely mad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you both decided to be together, he told you very clearly that there should be no game playing between you. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. What did you mean by that? I am not, and I try hard not to be the traditional person. Um, I don't believe that that can work anymore. I think that marriages of that kind were, were made for large families. You know yeah. what, I, I, I believe that people, she cannot carry all my baggage alone. Yeah. I cannot carry her baggage alone. We will destroy each other if we, we expect just one person to carry my baggage. My baggage is huge. So is hers. Not as huge as mine, but so is hers. Not uh, quite as huge as mine. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but, but when there were large joint families, people used to share your baggages. People used to share your schizophrenia. People used to share your madness. Now suddenly two people come together and say, us, just you and me. It's very difficult. Mm. But tell me, do you mostly have your way with him? It's a myth, you know. I mean, most... Most people think that in an older man, younger woman relationship, it's always the younger person tends to dominate, but that's not true. There's no one-upmanship mm. or anything like that, so... But um, this age difference, when people mention it, does it bother you? No. I kind of find it difficult to understand this whole concept of age difference. It's only when other people talk to me and say, this is your age. I feel pretty much as I did as when I was in university. Age is a myth that I... I I seem to time passage of time seems to be a myth. Are you, you do mean to infinity talk? No. Okay. No. I have yeah. a, a phrase called infinity. Whenever he just takes off at a tangent sometimes, and no, nobody has a clue about you know as to what he's talking about. Those are his infinity chats. I was just wondering if he's getting into his infinity mode right now. Does she bully you? Don't <laughs> shake her. I think she does. I think I'll have to wait for the program to end to handle this. <laughs> <laughs> her success matter to you? If her success gives her self-worth, then it's extremely important to me. Mm. Extremely. Because it's not possible to have an equal relationship with people who don't have self-worth. Mm. And it's not that she just has to share my excitement and be the housewife. I can you, share hers. How can you share it? So you're hardly there to share it, both of you. Oh, no. She had a show last night. And, and you were in Delhi. Yeah. Yeah, but she, I've never seen her show. He's not allowed to come to any. I'm not allowed to come want to him to? No. Why? I, I'll just get conscious. I'm, I don't know. I've never tried it. But right from the word go, he's been banned. But I share the excitement after the show. But are you actively supportive? Ask her. Is he actively? Yeah, he is actively supportive. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends, I mean, girls who've, uh, you know, educated who are, who've studied and who've been working and suddenly they get married and life just changes for them because their husbands don't want them to work and suddenly they're in this set up with in-laws and you know girls who came to college with me in shorts are now in a pal with a pallu on the head and mm. i can't handle it and i i think i'm really lucky that i have a man who allows me to have my own ambitions to allow allows me to have my own dreams uh, no not allows encourages encourages and yeah first allows and then encourages and who's very comfortable with that it doesn't uh, he doesn't feel that I have to be a reflection of him, which to me is fabulous. As a wife, I enjoy his success, but to me it's very important that I have my own. And he understands that and he encourages that. Is his career more important for you or is your own career more important? To me? Mm. It's a tough one. I would say my career is more important because my everyday life depends on my career, the work I'm doing. But his career, I mean, it's a wicked question to me. <laughs> it's very wicked, but his career is very, very important to me. But ultimately, you know, 
you're born alone and we die alone. So it, I have to, I have to live my life first before I can live our lives together. Suppose he was in South Africa. You have have an assignment here. You're cutting an album or doing the show, and he says, "Such so I need you." I would drop everything and run. If he ever said that, would you say that? No. If it was a choice between you see, because if I was shooting and she mm. really needed me, and I couldn't leave the shoot, I was under contract or something. I wouldn't, you know, I would think, think ten times before going. I would, if it was, if she could come, then I'd love her to come. But if mm. it was a question that she, if she was really tied up, I'll never be so tied up. Okay, <laughs> then I would ask. Does that answer your question? It does. Your careers are in separate continents. It gets lonely, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It does. For you, perhaps more shaker because you don't even have the support system. You're in another country. Yeah. At what times do you feel it most? Oh, I feel it all the time because I have no friends and every relationship is a new relationship and every relationship is born out of a professional uh, thing. So I get very lonely. So I even come back all the way from Los Angeles, I get four days off to just recharge it and to be at home. Um, now loneliness is the biggest single problem that I face right now in my career. And it's probably at a, at a time when you need to share more than ever before. Yeah, I guess so. I guess you need to share with somebody. I guess you need the sense of home. And uh, yes, you're right, I, I need to share. So we have very long telephone conversations, but... Uh, Huge bills. But uh, that's not, not quite there, is it? No, it's not. But I believe there are lots of glamorous women pursuing you. Huh? Big stars. Hard to resist women. So should should really worry. I wouldn't get jealous if somebody gave him attention. I would get jealous if he gave somebody attention. Define attention. Yeah. Define attention. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. If I thought he was, um, but then Shekhar is like that. He'll go through phases where he'll be extremely charming to one particular person, and the next week he's forgotten about it. So. And in the meantime, that person is taking it very seriously. So, it, I mean, if he, if he ever took it beyond that, then maybe I would, I would get pissed off about it. I would like to think that we respect each other enough to never cross those boundaries. Because what the goose can do, the gand... What is that? Something like <laughs> Something that. Something like that, good right? Goose. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. You okay. can't, you know, I mean, when you trust, you have to trust completely, otherwise... You yes. can't trust in degrees. Yeah. Any plans for the future? Any family? Kids? You answer that. Well, I think to have a kid, I think that from me it would take a certain settling down and a commitment to a place. I mean, you can't have a kid before you have a home. If two of us can handle it, the kid won't be able to handle it. Well, I hope everything works out beautifully for you. Professionally and personally, thank lots you. of happiness, lots of success. I want to thank you so much for coming over today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for Thanks. this rendezvous. Thank you. Writing your views on this program at Come, let's talk, you and Star Plus.